Yeah, bowling off this Thursday edition of the Sportsman Zone with cricket. Following his superb player of the series turn in Australia, Shamar Joseph is still making headlines ahead of the West Indies three-match ODI campaign set to begin tonight. Caribbean time at the Melbourne Cricket Ground MCG. Cricket West Indies announced earlier today that the 24-year-old's regional franchise contract has been upgraded to an international retainer in recognition of his superb efforts down under. In the meantime, Windes white ball coach Darren Sammy spoke glowingly about the Test Series hero and his chances of breaking into the squad for the shorter formats of the game. Speaking to ESPN Crickinfo, this is what Sammy had to say. He will definitely be an all-format player. I can't wait to get my hands on him in this squad. But look, everything has a process to it. That's the way myself and the chairman of selectors operate. What he's done is he's created a really good headache for me with the World Cup coming up, building forward in the ODI team. Sammy continued, we ride the wave that's happening there, but we won't go crazy if the guy's injured, let him go home and rest. That's probably the first time he's been away from home for so long. He's got a young family, so we understand whatever we do is well planned and well thought out. I think going home to his family Enjoying this moment is important because victories like that don't come around all the time. It's important that you enjoy these moments, savor it so that it keeps you motivated to have more moments like that. The West Indies white ball coach Darren Sam is speaking there about the test hero Shamar Joseph. The former West Indies captain, of course, selected Joseph as a replacement to the squad for Peshawar Zalmi in the Pakistan Super League, which begins in a little over a fortnight, despite Joseph not being selected in either white ball squad in Australia, although the understanding is he um, would have been asked to remain in Australia um, if not for the toe injury that he got. So very important, of course, um, Darren Sami, the coach of the Zalma team in the PSL. Let's um, get Fazir Mohammed involved in this conversation. Um, Faz, I, I, unprecedented because I don't know if in the history of awarding contracts in West Indies cricket, we have seen in the middle of a contract period that a player gets upgraded from anything, um, much less moving from no international contract to an international contract. Of course, all he had before was a franchise deal. Your thoughts? You're right. I, I don't recall this ever happening, uh, but you could understand why. You could understand why, especially not just because of his phenomenal achievements, but for the fact of all of these franchises looking around. So there would obviously be a level of urgency, even desperation to get him signed on to a retainer contract that allows some form of discussion with Cricket West Series. And I think that's so very important, which is why I was so delighted to hear your interview with Ian Bishop, because I think Ian, as someone who's played the game at the highest level, knows what it is to be an out-and-out -out fast bowler, what can happen in relation to injuries. And I thought he made a very, very relevant point that I wasn't thinking of at all, that yes, it's all well and good to play as many franchise tournaments, boost up your revenue and whatever else without getting injured, but it could work against your pace, that you could lose those energy levels that has you from being a, a tear away fast bowler frightening the lives out of the best batters in the world to someone who's good very good but still lacking in that raw pace and i think that's very very important so i, I would hope that this is a template not just for shamar joseph but moving forward that there is that understanding that one players have to earn a living they have short lifespans as far as the peak of their careers but also it's about managing it effectively to ensure that not just Shamar Joseph, Alzari Joseph, Jaden Seals, anyone else who comes up. I heard Ian talking about a young fast bowler also from Babis, who's from a very poor community, who has tried his best for them to, to get an opportunity with Guyana, with the franchise. It hasn't happened as yet. So this is really where you need to listen 
to players, to individuals who've been there, who've done that, who could offer that sort of advice. Yeah, very much the case. And I get the feeling that Cricket West Indies and the West Indies Players Association are starting to understand the importance of this just coming out of the MOU that they signed recently. And if you look at the recent trend as well, this administration has been more willing, I would say, to let players go and play in franchise leagues. Um, we are going to speak about the One Day International Series coming up against Australia, but the captain, Shea Hope, Darren Sammy as well, the head coach, have been preaching the importance of building squad depth because it is in having squad depth that you will be able to allow players to consistently go and play in these franchise leagues while being relatively confident that the players you do have can perform well at the highest level. Absolutely. To be fair, I don't think any Cricket West Indies administration has ever attempted to prevent a player from signing on to one of these franchises. So it's not like, as we've seen in Pakistan, where players are refused no objection clauses no to, to their contract. We don't see that happening, thankfully, in the Caribbean because we simply can't compete. But I think what you're seeing now, and this is, I think, more to your point, a, a level of a willingness to discuss. Remember what happened that that, that infamous occasion in 2014 when, when WIPA had signed on to an arrangement to allow for players' earnings to go towards the regional first-class cricket and the prominent players didn't know anything about it and it resulted in the abandonment of the Indian tour of 2014 and all the bad blood around that time. So yes, it's about having a mature discussion. Not a discussion that says, I am in charge and this is what I'm offering you. It's a discussion that says, okay, this is the lay of the land, gentlemen, ladies, what do we do about it? Yeah, and just to get back to the Shamar Joseph discussion, um, because the white ball head coach, and I've been quite keen to hear from someone like a Darren Sammy on how he sees the future of this young man in limited overs cricket. So based on his performances in Australia, absolutely no doubt he has a future in test cricket, um, but limited overs cricket now. And Darren Sammy is saying, yes, we have a problem, a good problem, but a problem nonetheless, because we now have to look at this young man for the T20 World Cup. Do you feel Darren Sammy is saying the right things on this matter? I believe he is. And, you know, I have to say, Ricardo, Mariah and Lance, I'm almost, re I'm almost relieved for Shamar that if he's not on the boat already, that he's on the boat back to Bar Barakara pretty soon. Because that, that is, is his home base. These are the people who really matter to him. And you're going to get a lot of people, even us from the media, piling in, wanting to get a piece of the action, wanting to claim a bit of him and so on, claim some credit and the other. Thankfully, Brandon Kolek was the first off the boat to get to, to Barakara from, from Babishan himself uh, to have that interview with him on, on, his, on his podcast and so on. So, yes, it, it's really a time when there's going to be so much noise so much interest, most of it well-meaning, but a lot of it exploitative as well. So we need to be mindful of that. And maybe it's the best thing that he's going to be back at home with his family, with his uncles, talking about the experience while all of this goes on. Yeah, Faz, we're not trying in any way to take any credit for Shamar Joseph's performances, but we are trying to get an interview with him. And guess who is leading that charge? Is it you? No, it's not. It's the one and only Mariah Ramarak. Oh, I already okay. sorted that out, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for telling everybody. <laughs> All right, Faz, so it's my time to question you. So, of course, um, you know, I'm looking at everything, and while you're, I was following the discussion with you and Ricardo about Shamar really just getting back home, I think, you know, yes, it's very, very necessary because, you know, even having discussions with my own sister, when you do well, everybody, as you said, wants a piece of the action, right? It's like you're being pulled and tugged in different directions. And sometimes you're just not sure what comes next. And I think sometimes that can also have a negative effect on you. And we spoke about it on this show, I think it was yesterday, where the next time, you know, he suits up for the team, he can also, it can be negative in the sense that he feels as if the job is again in his hands to, of course, deliver with the ball and with the bat because we saw potential from him also with the bat. You mentioned, you know, it's so, so important that he gets back to the family. 
fast he gets ready for the PSL in a bit, do you think that we'll be seeing the same sort of Shamar that we saw in that test series? Or do you think he's going to, based on what we saw with his confidence and his, his approach, that, you know, we'll get a more measured performance? Well, Shamar is Shamar. I, I, I think what you see is someone who rejoices in being in this environment, who, who revels in, 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 in the limelight. Uh, we saw that early on with the ball when he got that five-wicket hole in Adelaide. And, and more than likely, you're going to see similar sorts of showmanship when the PSL kicks in and he's playing playing for Peshawar Zalmi. But I think more than anything else, we want to see someone who enjoys what he's doing. The moment it becomes burdensome, the moment it becomes, you can't turn left, right or center without someone shoving a camera in your face, shoving a microphone in your face, wanting a signature, wanting an autograph. It, it can be too much. And I think that's where the managing of the situation comes in and having those around him to advise him properly. Because it is quite possible that some can all around him can get carried away with it and, and get greedy with it. I hope not, and I, I expect that they won't because they seem very well grounded. Because you can almost want everything right away. And, and that is where that measured sort of advice, people like Ian Bishop who've been there, uh, Brian Lara, who's had his own experiences. Brian Lara famously mentioned a year after his world record year of 2014, 2000, sorry, 1994, I'm getting carried away, 1994. Yes. He said the cricket was ruining his, his life. And he walked away from the West Indies team on tour of England in 2015. Yes. All because of the, the pressures that were being put on him N by so many extraneous issues. Yeah. 95 fires. Not, not 95, it was 1994 that he had those records. And the year after, 1995, you're correct, uh, was when he said that cricket was ruining his life. So it, it, it's important that we put these things in perspective and understand that as much as everybody wants a piece of Shamar Joseph or anyone else, that these are human beings with yeah. their own that they've already had a, their their own lives established already. Let them enjoy being with their own friends and family, and and then revel in the atmosphere once more when the time comes. Yeah, because that's exactly what motivates them and spurs them on. So tonight on Sportsmax, we have the first ODI of three ODIs. Faz, talk to me about that. How are you feeling as we get ready for this ODI? Because everybody is acting as if it's the same team that played in the test is going to be suiting up for the ODI. No, no, no. Two different formats, two different teams. Just Alzari Joseph uh, joining the ODI setup. What are we to expect from our ODI team? But well, let's hope that the team can carry the form that they finished up last year into this series. Because, again, as, as was pointed out in the introduction, West Indies and Australia hardly ever meet in one-day internationals. They played a tri-series in 2016, together with South Africa in the Caribbean, where the West Indies reached the final against Australia and lost. Since then, they've only met four times. A, a World Cup, of course, there was no World Cup for the West Indies this time around when Australia lifted the title. There was a, a three-match series in the Caribbean in 2021, which Australia won 2-1. That's the last time that they would have played. So there's an, even though they, they met just a few days ago in Test Match Cricket, there's an element of the unknown here. Because again, that number 27, which you also mentioned in the introduction, West Indies haven't beaten an Australian team in an ODI in Australia for 27 years. And you're seeing a number of different players, not just in the West Indies team, but in the Australian team. You don't have the spearhead of their bowling attack that won the World Cup this time around. So they, like the West Indies, are doing a, a feeling out process as they prepare their team for defense of the title in 2027. And in the West Indies case, to at least try and qualify for the World Cup in 2027. Yeah, Faz, Shea Hope's batting in ODI cricket has been exemplary. And as far as the batting rankings are concerned, he comes into this series as the most accomplished batsman on either team. Um, how much pressure is there on Shea Hope to deliver here? And uh, will he need the support of some of the other young guns like um, Athenes and company to support whatever effort he's able to deliver? I, I don't get the sense that Shea Hope feels that pressure too much, if anything, you, you would often find that we, we tend to see times, sometimes, Lance, someone is burdened by captaincy and it gets the better of them. They, they struggle to perform. Drew Root was a classic example for England when he lost the captaincy. Look how, look how Ben Stokes is reveling in 
Uh, she Hope is not that expressive type of personality, but he seems to enjoy his role as captain. He seems to enjoy batting at number four or maybe opening the batting again because there's no Brandon King this time around. So there'll be some shuffling around of the order. And yes, it's, it's automatic that you need the support from others. No one player can ever win a cricket match, either batting or bowling, because there's got to be support from the other end. Yes, someone might score the most runs, someone might take nearly all the wickets, but there still has to be support from the other end. So yes, it's important for Athenes, it's important if other players, like Teddy Bishop, who's brand new to this level of the game, if some who were in, with the test squad, Justin Graves, some who were with the squad but didn't play, like Tevin Imlach, if they're given opportunities, this is their chance to really stake a claim for a consistent spot in a West Indies one-day side. Yeah, and for us, as we look to the under-19 World Cup fixture the West Indies boys have against the Aussies on, on Friday, which will be critical to their semi-final hopes, and uh, the euphoria of uh, Shamar Joseph, do you get a sense that this ODI assignment for this West Indies team with Shea Hope and, and, and his team, there is a recognition on their part that the team is in a position to propel itself beyond what we have seen for decades because we know that success is something that triggers a lot of things including improving the product of West Indies cricket which has a lot to do with the marketing of the team because I think part of the CWI struggles with getting the kind of financial backing and sponsorship for West Indies cricket. I don't think we can deny that the lack of success for the team has impacted that. Um, do you think the, the team feels motivated at the moment by what happened in Brisbane and their opportunity to keep that going? I think Shea Hope said so in, in, in one of his early interviews. And it's, it's inevitable. I mean, and you know, Lance, Mariah and Ricardo, it really reinforces the stature of Test Match Cricket because West Indies have had successes in other formats. But look at the reaction to winning a Test Match in Australia. And because of that, it, there's almost an aura now. Previously, it would have been, well, you know, maybe the one decide to save our embarrassment. Maybe the T20 squad will res rescue some pride for us after being annihilated in a Test Series. No, it's a different situation. And now they are expected to carry it forward. It's not automatic because it's Australia you're playing against. Any opponent that you're going to be playing against will be looking for to, to get the better of you because they have their own agendas. So, so yes, it, it, it feels like a, a euphoric time, but it's a time when the, those involved, those in the middle, those who go out this afternoon Melbourne time to get into action, should not lose their focus on their individual and collective priorities to perform to their best in the colours of the West Indies. Faz, thanks for talking to us as usual. And uh, we are all, as cricket fans, getting ready to watch this first ODI. It comes up live on Sportsmax at 11.30 Eastern Caribbean time, 10.30 in Jamaica. And uh, that's certainly early enough for 95% of us to be watching. Thanks, Faz. Indeed. <laughs> but for aging people like myself, it's becoming a challenge. But given the euphoria, I'll stay awake. Yeah, I, I know you will, Faz, that's for sure. And we'll talk about it tomorrow. Uh, don't uh, leave us at the moment. Coming up after the break, we have Sean Bridgemahan, uh, one of the most successful Caribbean riders in the history of uh, horse racing in the USA, along with the Barbadian Patrick Husbands, well over 3,000 wins in North America. He'll be live in the studio on the other side of the break. Back in a moment.